Hi, my name is April T and I'm a senior in the University of Washington's program on the environment. This is my capstone project entitled Getting Our Bearings, Best Methods for Monitoring Polar Bear Populations. And my internship was with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Alaska Fishery Science Center. So many of us may be familiar with polar bears in the sense that they have become somewhat of an unfortunate poster child for climate change. The pictures of scrawny polar bears floating on top of tiny pieces of ice circulating online that urge us to stop global warming. This concern for polar bears is well warranted because climate change poses more and more of a threat to the Arctic environment each year. Most polar bears are reliant on seasonal sea ice for their livelihoods and climate change is causing major changes in ice seasonality and viable habitat extent for the bears, which could cause drastic population declines of this sensitive species. There are 19 polar bear subpopulations that span the circumpolar Arctic. This map in the bottom left-hand corner outlines polar bear habitat and is broken into subpopulations, and it shows a vast extent that polar bears occupy. To get you oriented, the view is looking downwards on the Arctic, with the North America on the left and Asia and Europe on the right, and Seattle is indicated by the red dot. As you may guess, the unique environment and vastness of the Arctic poses a major challenge to monitoring polar bear populations. Many subpopulations lack historical and or up-to-date population estimates. As climate change poses a larger and larger threat to polar bears, more frequent and comprehensive population monitoring is necessary, which highlights the importance of analyzing the methods that are used to possibly identify the most effective methods. And this brings me to my research question, which is what are the opportunities and challenges of current polar bear and population monitoring methods? To attempt to answer this question, I utilized experiences from my internship, as well as conducted a literature review. In my internship with NOAA, I reviewed over 12,000 images from the aerial surveys of the Beaufort Sea region off of Alaska for the presence of polar bears. The images you see, or the image you see, is one I encountered in my work of a mom and cub pair, and it's blown up in the red circle, and it shows you the scale of and gives you an idea of the images that I was working with. I compared my observations to the output of a computer machine learning model to review the performance of and help train this machine learning model to effectively detect in polar bears within imagery in hopes to eventually automate the aerial imagery review process. Through my research, I began to find that methods can typically be categorized as either contact, which may also be referred to as invasive, or non-contact or non-invasive. Some examples of contact methods are things like collaring and tagging in which uh, tracking devices are placed on polar bears while they are sedated. So these methods involve direct research contact with the polar bears. Examples of non-contact methods are aerial survey, satellite imagery, passive field sampling, sampling, and local community member accounts. So anything that does not involve direct bear contact. I found that there are trade-offs between using one method category or the other, which I have summarized in this table on the right. Now, this table is a very broad generalization of only some of the important aspects to consider in using a particular monitoring method. And as I will discuss, some of these can be a yes, but, or a no, but answer. So the first category is physiological data, which is measurements like weight, age, temperature, et cetera, that can tell us about the health of polar bears. Most contact methods are able to get this data because researchers land on the ice and handle sedated polar bears. Non-contact methods cannot really get this data from a distance. Having this health data can be very important in addition to population estimates to have a more thorough understanding of the state of polar bears. And the next category is the cost of the methods. So contact methods are definitely very costly as it involves a lot of specialized equipment. Now, non-contact methods can also be costly and equipment involved, but they can also be less costly depending on the approach, which is why I put both yes and no for this category. Funding is one of the biggest barriers to frequent and comprehensive monitoring as there's often a lack of funding that inhibits researchers from being able to implement monitoring projects. And in terms of human labor costs, contact methods have a large upfront labor cost, putting researchers into the Arctic and on the ice, while some non-contact methods have high human labor costs more later on. For example, the work that I did in my internship reviewing imagery re represents a large human review component of aerial surveys that is very human labor intensive. The automation of these methods is not yet reliable as well. In my internship, I identified 34 polar bears and the machine learning model we use identified only 53% of these bears. In terms of long-term data, contact methods are able to achieve this through collaring and tagging, which can give them possibly years of data, while non-contact methods are limited to the time of the event. 
This means that non-contact methods are typically employed less frequently as there is a limited time period when um, researchers can land on the ice and because of the expenses. Non-contact methods may also be limited in time period because of extreme weather in the Arctic, but can generally be, can, can generally be employed more frequently. And to generalize, contact methods can be less safe for researchers because of the fact that they are stepping foot into the Arctic environment and are subject to the unpredictable conditions, and they are in contact with the bears, even though they are sedated. That being said, non-contact methods are generally set, uh, safer, but field methods like aerial surveys are still subject to the Arctic environment and can also be unsafe. All these trade-offs I just covered are important to consider in order to standardize or prioritize a particular monitoring method for frequent and comprehensive polar bear population estimates. There is a public push towards non-contact methods as public concern over the handling of polar bears continues to grow. There's also the desire and possibly the need to innovate these non-contact methods to improve them as climate change may one day make contact methods much less viable. Overall, collaboration among agencies and countries will be necessary to achieve the frequent and comprehensive monitoring that we need to help understand the impact that climate change is having on polar bears. So thank you so much for listening. I would like to thank my site supervisor, Aaron Moreland, my faculty advisor, Alex McIntyre, and my capstone cohort for guiding me through my capstone. And I would also like to thank my mom, my dad, my sister, and my friends for their never ending support. Thank you so much.